Give me a sec. Um, Makisa, let me know. Yeah, we got it. Right, let's do it. Stephen, uh, let me start recording. All right. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to another seminar. We're very pleased to have the chair of the Department of Sociology and Social Anthropology at this uh, university. As some of you all know, um, Professor Bernard Tabbelt is going to give a talk, and the title is up there, so I don't need to repeat it. His interests generally, as you probably also know from having done courses with him or engaged with him in various ways on social theory, capital and labor, governance and citizenship, issues of housing, race, and South African social sciences. He's also the editor of Social Dynamics. And in recent years, he's published on um, a number of issues uh, related to social grants and tax transfers in rural areas of South Africa, and also engaged in uh, critical theory. A, a recent paper is um, entitled Translating Ethan <coughs> Thompson's Marxist Critique, Contesting Context in South African Studies. And Earlier on um, the previous year, a publication on, entitled After Revision of Marxism, Reanimating the Critique of Capitalism in South African Studies and Transformation. So, issues, and fortunately, um, many of you who are in this room have been exposed to Professor Dalek's social theory classes, and so you get quite a rigorous training in. Um, in Marxist theory and post-Marxist theory, and, and you have a sense of this department um, in, in terms of your engagement with theory through the courses you've done with Professor Dobbelt. And let's get started. I think you know the, the routine: 40 minutes to 50 minutes, and then we'll go we'll have discussion. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, uh, I feel like my theory class to the department haven't been as, uh, as Marxist as you as you would suggest, but uh, uh, I guess you can ask the students. There's still time. There. There's still time. <laughs> okay, so today I'm going to speak about um, what I hope will be the first chapter, not the introduction of, uh, of my book. Um, it comes from um, dissertation fieldwork I did some time ago. Um, and this chapter has been, for some, to some extent, a kind of problem for me because it's really a, a <coughs> historical chapter and it describes quite a different set of arrangements from the present. Uh, so uh, I've sort of left it aside and come back to it uh, uh, twice since the dissertation. So this is, a, I set myself the goal of kind of trying. Um, admit being department chair to kind of knock it out in the next um, few months um, and, and hopefully by January knock, knock this chapter out. So this is a, um, a fairly recent iteration of it and um, I'm curious of your thoughts. Um, okay, so this is a presentation uh, which talks about the border project, saying lots of African sugar production, laid out specific sites, uh, its history and working through that history. Final section that is explicitly interpreted in a in a in a revised draft that interpretation will hopefully feed the entire the entire project. But at this stage, of, um, entire chapter at this stage, that's left quite separate. Um, and so, with the invitation of thinking about how to structure it, what this is, and how that might shape the eventual composition. So this is the first study chapter, as I was saying in a study of a countryside place without work or sustained income from agriculture. The book is called Unsettled Futures, Surplus Populations, and the Paradoxes of the post party Project in the Countryside. Uh, and it's largely, as I said, a contemporary project, right? Uh, a project at the very least, I don't know if you can call it contemporary anymore, but a post apartheid project, a project that 
works from the late 1990s and asks from the perspective of uh, an RDP housing settlement, uh, what has post-apartheid brought? What kinds of changes has it brought? Uh, how might we think of the, the, the project of democratic transformation, at least democratic transformation until the period of Marikana. I think things change a little bit after Marikana. But the first 18 years or so uh, of democracy, what does it look like to be a recipient of, uh, of the promise of democracy, of the promise of democratic transformation, of the promise of reversing apartheid? So this chapter uh, focused on a time prior to that, right? In the same location, right? Where you had sugar production and sugar milk, but a deeply entrenched racial division of labor, right? So we go, we go to a space in which there's no work, right? Uh, and in which uh, that division of labor looks different because there, there's, no, there's no labor to divide, right? Um, literally. Um, <clears throat> and we go, we go to a prior moment and we think about that. And so obviously the faith in a sense can stand alone, but the question is what is the connection? So is this just a piece of history then, unconnected to the present? And how might we connect it to the present? Right? Okay, so the area that I work in, that I did field work in, is called Glendale, right? This is quite a Guzo, otherwise formerly known as Stanga. This is a political map, so this shows post apartheid municipalities. Uh, Glendale is in the sort of hinterland, it's about 30, 30 odd kilometers from Stanga. Um, and these are some images. This is the old sugar mill that uh, now still produces some ethanol e e extract. Um, but it's owned by Lobo. Uh, this, is a, this is some of the housing settlements. This is what I call first generation RDP housing projects. Um, about 30 square meters, uh, 100 RDP houses outside lavatories that we, you know, and um, erected in 2002, right? Housing approximately, uh, depending on the time of year, because people, people move and migrate from the area, but around 400 people, uh, sorry, around 400 houses uh, and up to 1,000 people, right? It's not densely populated, although it is, for a rural space, it is a concentration of people. Okay, so I wanted to start with South African sugar production, something that may not be familiar to many of you, um, although at least to one of you, I'm sure that, uh, or to, to Cheryl and Simon, I'm sure this is very familiar. Um, but maybe to others too. So the sugar industry in Colonia Natal emerges in the 1850s. Over 150,000 people are brought from India as indentured workers uh, between 1860 and 1911. Indentured workers, this is not a slave relation in the sense that workers are not, those working are owned as property, but it's not free, a free wage relation in the sense that workers can't choose their employer. They can't choose the best conditions of work. They bonded to an employer over long-term contracts at low wages and had very limited mobility. Um, and this happened across the British Empire, right? In many sugar-producing places, including the Caribbean, uh, you had this intention, right? Sugar production comprised the both the cultivation of sugarcane, right? It's growing and harvesting, and the milling of sugar. Right? Uh, while farmers and millers are distinct operations, in the late 19th century itself, what emerged were miller planters, right? As mills took over and cultivated surrounding fields, right? So the mill would, uh, the millers would, would buy the fields or appropriate them, and, uh, and they grew. These are sugar estates grew. They gradually became sugar estates. Approximately eight families ended up dominating sugar from the 1880s until the 1970s. They were dubbed by David Lincoln in a, in a fabulous PhD thesis that was never published in the book called The Sugarocracy. They were aristocrats, as he said, or quasi aristocrats. They funded private schooling uh, in, 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 in the Natal. I think they, 
we might even have Kersney College, um, etc. You know, and the Crooks brothers went to be part of them. There, you know, there was just Hewlett's, etc. Right? All in English speaking. After the 1970s, they agglomerated into corporations, um, and so Hewlett's, Sugar, Tom by Hewlett, Elova, etc. All they all came through these these companies, right? Uh, so a stark division of labor, racial division of labor emerged on these sugar fields between white owners and managers, right? And they were also white who were mill technicians, often brought from Mauritius, right? Uh, Indian cane growers and Africans who were employed casually, right? Uh, at the very bottom of this, of this hierarchy. So uh, in the, at, at, the, at the outset of sugar production, or in the first 50 years of sugar production, uh, the mill was staffed by whites, the fields were generally uh, uh, staffed by Indians, and or Indian indentured workers, or, you know, and then some Africans worked uh, as casuals on the market, right? There, were, there is some evidence of African independent sugar, sugar production, but it was squashed, right, in the early 20th century. Uh, Indian workers lived and their families lived in sugar villages around mills from the late 1950s. There was some upward mobility of Indians working, moving into mill work and greater numbers of Africans employed in the field to plant the harvest. But still, those, uh, those African workers were not, not permitted to live in the area around the mill. Right? Except there were migrant, there were some migrants from the Transcar who lived in, in barrack accommodations as migrant workers. And apartheid's group area areas boundaries were negotiated to ensure productivity without disrupting this racial division of labor. So uh, the two maps here, uh, one of which gets the ocean wrong, um, but uh, <laughs> um, these are both both maps from the late 80s. The one shows it's from Bill Freund's. Uh, book. Uh, this shows Indian-owned uh, Indian -owned agricultural land on the north coast. Uh, that's, those are the shaded areas. Glendale's there, right? Uh, this stops before the boundary of KwaZulu. Um, this shows African reserve areas, KwaZulu, the KwaZulu bunch of, bunch of stuff. And their proximity to two books. Right, that's that. This, of course, is in Kozulu, uh, but their proximity to mills. So again, supplies of uh, of cheap labor, cheap African labor that had no rights at all. It was it was casualized, etc. Um, so Galenda as a village was founded in the 1870s. It was called one of the most inaccessible but yet productive spots in. Um, in the then Natal, by uh, Reynolds, who was one of the sugarocracy. It changed hands a couple of times and it was bought, bought by Ismail Farouk in 1924, making it the only Indian owned mill until democracy, right? And of course, you know, the category of Indian there is complicated as well by, uh, by different passages to, to South Africa. Um, but suffice to say, this, this was a family that had. Grown in prominence in the, in the interwar period, uh, they founded Gem Clothing in Durban, um, and they actually lent their name to a suburb called Parlock, uh, together with the Lockup family. Parlock um, uh, upgraded the housing for mill workers in the 20s and 30s and founded a primary school in the area bearing his name, Parlock Kubat, uh, in 1942. But operating a lone sugar mill for 45 years, right, against the increasing concentration of ownership. And improving technology of sugar milling, transportation, which allowed people to, uh, roads, which allowed people to transport cane, particularly in the 1960s. Some spoke of how they, in the final years, they paid workers through the company store, and that their last general manager, Robin McGregor, said that when he arrived in '62, the operation lacked direction. Um, so in the 60s, uh, the Parukhs decided to sell the mill. By this time, the roads of transportation of Cane had improved significantly, and the land under Cane supplying the mill, along with the mill itself, 
was an interest to large companies that emanated from the sugar hot receipt of C.D. Smith and Phillips. Facing a takeover from one of these companies inspired him to tell India <coughs> to mount a rival bid. The problem was that if C.D. Smith or Hewlett bought the mill, they would have closed it and simply transported the cane to their own mills. Right? They didn't need that. Right? This meant that the community living blender would no longer be able to stay in the village. While this rival bid was unsuccessful, as told by McGregor himself in a local history project through the area, this community implored McGregor to seek a buyer that would ensure the continuation of production. Right? So that Glenda wouldn't just become a series of farms that would supply one of the bigger mills. Um, we also know from McGregor that the apartheid state in the early 60s had, been, had an interest in keeping Glenda in Indian hands and bailed out the Parros in 62, right, when, they, when they went through a, a financial crisis. So Lock, McGregor traveled to London in 1969 and convinced the London Rhodesia company, Lonro, you may have heard of London, um, uh, who are connected, right? Who had, who had successful sugar operations elsewhere in Africa to buy Glen Delphine, right? Bullock took over from McGregor's manager once the sale was concluded. He told me when he arrived at the mill, quote, a lot of equipment that was there was like an operating museum. I mean, some of the equipment dated back to the beginning of the 20th century, and it worked and was kept going by the old faithfuls. Some of them had gone to Mauritius to learn how to operate them. They used to love their old steam engines, and we used to employ them in droves because each engine or set of engines used to have its own operator. But when you run a 24-7 operation, you've got to have three operators, and we used to employ a lot of people like that. By the time I got there, those chaps were really old, and eventually we pensioned them off. And with that, we changed the style and the nature of the equipment, put in more modern stuff that did not require personal attention. And in my time there, that was 25 years, we more than halved the labor force in the factory. And that was just by the economics of the whole thing. To make it happen, you have to move all the time. So, you know, we could offer a parenthesis here that, you know, that when we talk about Marxist capital, the experience of being in business is one of needing constant innovation to stay afloat. Right? What Postone called the treadmill effect of running to stand still. Right? So, Lonro hired engineers that found component parts and further more from surrounding mills being closed down, as well as boilers from Bulawayo and coal plants from Sasselburg. They, employed, uh, they imported a turbo alternator from the UK and built some of its components to adapt it for, for use themselves. According to a commentator on the Tel Sugar Mills, introduction of these components, quote, enabled the use of a closed circuit caustic cleaning system, which is both quicker and less labor intensive than previous methods of employment. Lonro also regularized the wages of workers, which have been inconsistent in the final part of the years. An additional difficulty for Lonro in taking over Glendale is the supply of cane. So Glendale Sugar Mill was a miller planter arrangement, as I suggested earlier, but the fields it owned were much smaller than the sugar and all the huge conglomerate com companies that emerged in their place. To keep the mill going, to achieve its maximum output, especially with this new technology, they had to secure cane supply from surrounding farmers. Right, so in fields they didn't themselves own. They initiated, soon after takeover, a successful fort battle against the encroachment of rival sugar companies on nearby farmers, uh, supplying them. Right? And then they offered loans and expertise to small-scale farmers close to Glendale, many of whom lived in the Kozulu of Pakistan, only six kilometers away. Glendale also made an agreement with the Kozulu Finance Corporation to assist with funding. By the 1980s, it was reported that the mill relied on small-scale farmers for 40% of its claim. And the mill seemed to be yielding an impressive quantity of sugar. But we'll return to the condition of these small farmers and the fate of this development in a moment. So, Lonro did more than invest just in improving production, right? They sponsored electrification, the purification of water, and extended sanitation to the, visit, the village. They subsidized the building of new classrooms of the school. In, in the early 70s, when the Bunch of Affairs Department planned to incorporate Glendale into the Kwazulu homeland, Lonro and the Italian Cane Growers Association 
Association's concerted effort to keep Glendale and India all beyond the border with Kozulu was successful, right? They managed to lobby the government to, to draw the map slightly differently. And I've got two different maps from the, the, the National Archives that show Glendale either in the Bantustan or out of the Bantustan um, over a period of 10 years, as well as letters lobbying um, those who were drawing group areas boundaries, right? Um, when disaster struck in the 1987 flood, with roads and bridges washed away and telephone and electricity connections destroyed, Lonero fronted a considerable sum, 2.25 million at the time, and worked out how much that from 87 is worth today for the repair and building of the construction homes. Right? At the 50th anniversary celebration of primary school in 92, the Shuri Company was held as protecting the producing community and even civilization in this once inaccessible valley. Bullock was the guest of honor, and he in turn praised technological innovation, hard work, and self reliance, as you might expect. Um, so, who were the African plain growers who supplied the <coughs> And how do you understand them more generally? Right? As I noted earlier, there had been some plain growing by Africans in the late 19th century, but much of this was taken over by by the large sugar estates owned by the sugar sugar office. By 1944, Similani notes that Africans only owned 1% of the land on which sugar cane was produced, while Indians owned 11% and African and whites 88%. In the early 70s, just after Lonro's purchase of Glendale, the South African Sugar Association created a fund dedicated to the development of, of small independent cane growers <coughs> in the the homeland, a potential new market for the growing of cane. A new source for the growing cane. This fund, which began operating in 73, was known as Small Cane, Small Growers Financial Aid Fund, and had its business providing loans and general assistance, starting with an initial 5 million rand dedicated to loans. These loans were allocated to black farmers in the Kwazulu homeland and facilitated by chiefs. This fund also supported irrigation schemes, including the one at in Tandeni in the, in the homeland but near Glendale. After, five, four, after the first 14 years of the project in 88, the South African Sugar Association claimed that the scheme had helped to create 19,000 small scale growers. So Kerala, a manager, suggested in his 1999 PhD that the scheme managed to produce 50,000 small scale growers from the 4,500 at the initiation of the project. Right? So the boost of the project said that this was a very successful thing. Right? Yet how autonomous was this African peasantry being encouraged within the borders of KwaZulu by white-owned and managed sugar industry with some support from Manchester administrations and therefore also by the apartheid regime? To what extent might small-scale African farmers have to work through chiefs and would the scale of their farms give them capacity to be self-sufficient, make a profit and have a degree of autonomy over to whom they might sell their cane? Large scale producers at the time, C.G. Smith and Hewlett, were likely to be encouraged by additional cane supply, especially if it, could, if it could be directed to their mills. Such small scale farmers did not have the possibility of milling, they didn't have the capital to buy mills, they didn't have the capacity to compete, right? And posed no threat to them, right? And born in 1990, asks whether these small cane growers could constitute a, a new class of, the, of independent peasant producers, or whether this was really a new relation of dependency, right, with the mothers. Writing on Glendale, Vaughan notes that African cane growers supplying the mill average, average plots of 1.5 hectares, and that few would have the capacity to grow into larger producers. Moreover, she says, while Glendale sugar mothers in the South African Sugar Journal claim the success of small-scale farmers in the area, claimed that the success of small-scale farmers in the area encouraged people to stay on the land and not to migrate to urban areas, even enticing people back to farming. Vaughan argues that the permanent return of migrants to cane growing areas for the purpose of becoming self-sufficient commercial farmers is not likely to be a significant trend. The farmers are often women left behind in rural areas and less, and less frequently retired and they return to urban areas. This is not to suggest that the income from the cane farming is unimportant, 
However, remittances from migrants, work in industrial areas, and pensions are the, are the basic sources of income which have not been replaced by income from trade. So there's some doubt as, the, as to the viability of this uh, project um, that the boosters sort of claim, right? Uh, and we'll speak more about that. So to return to, Lon to Lonro, Lonro and, and Glendale, in 1994, the new Minister of Water Affairs, the then new Minister of Water Affairs, Carla Asmar, visited Glendale. He urged that a big dam be built in the area to aid small scale farmers and that African workers be provided, be given a permanent home in Glendale. Lon Road donated an attractive land in the plain next to the sugar village for the building of hardy houses. So it seems at the, at, the, at the dawn of democracy that perhaps uh, some of that harsh racial division of labor would be flattened a bit and that and that Africans will be able to work alongside Indians in the, in the mill. That dam, though, was never constructed. In 96, boardroom battles in London led to the departure of the CEO, Tiny Rowland, an unbundling of the company with mining and sugar separated, and a strategic de decision to focus on platinum, leading to the sale of Long Road Sugar. Glendale, which never managed <coughs> to, to turn a sustained profit because of its size and supply of cane was sold in 1973 Lover. Within six months the mill was closed and the cane farms claimed by Lover. Most of the Indians living in Canada are there. Right? The houses, the IEP houses, were indeed built and became the basis of life in the area after the mill's closed. So you have the mill, the houses which you saw in the picture, uh, but you don't have any any work. Right? So how do we interpret this? And there's several things I've been thinking of over time, um, and, and perhaps you, you could, I invite you to help me with this. So we could use James Ferguson's idea of company towns and their social business. Right? Ferguson writes in, 19, in 2006, on the Zambian copper belt, investment in copper mining brought the construction of vast company towns for some 100,000 workers. Workers who in time came to be skilled, unionized, highly paid, and politically powerful. Those mining towns, classic era examples of colonial era corporate paternalism, eventually came to include not only company provided housing, schools, and hospitals, but also social workers. Here, the business of mining, exploited though it undoubtedly was, entailed a broader social, a very significant broader project. Its presence was socially thick. Ferguson contrasts the social thickness with thin investments characteristic of more recent uh, investments in Africa, with the extraction of oil off the coast of Angola being the paradigmatic case, where investment in Angola means not even touching the, Angola, the, the, Ang the land of Angola, and that money not really resulting in any kind of social good. So Ferguson thus shows that the kinds of investments beyond immediate production do matter. And that these were historically done not only by governments, but also by corporations. That there was a, a commitment to a building of a social fabric. Um, Richard Sennett, in uh, his wonderful book, The Corrosion of Character, speaks about the way that, despite kind of capitalist exploitation, there was a real difference between social forms that built something, built, that allowed people to compose lives, that, that enabled a kind of social reproduction, versus a more uh, flexible, and of course flexible capitalist arrangement in which work is, is temporary, is, is, is broken up, is uncertain, and that life can't be composed around that, right? Um, so it's in this vein that, that Ferguson suggests, let's think about what these corporations did. It's easy to kind of say, well, you know, these are exploitative and so on, but let's look at the social investments that they made, what lasted, right? Um, for Indian workers, the experience of the multinational company offered security through Lonro's investment, not only in the productive capacity of the mill, but also its socially reproductive elements. Right? From housing and school to the area's roads and sanitation, Lonro provided more than a wage. It was therefore classically socially thick and not the thin neoliberal model of investments. Yet we cannot 
fail to notice that even how even this idea of company towns in South Africa was threaded through a racial division of labor. All Indian respondents who lived in Glendale spoke affirmatively of the pre-1996 past and expressed sor sorrow over the mill's closure. By contrast, Africans in Glendale spoke with the desire for some kind of reduction in the area that might include them more fully. Even democracy, as I've discussed elsewhere, has for its contemporary residents signaled a kind of inclusion that is less tangible and has happened without any clear capacity to participate or to in secure or regular capitalist production, right? It's been an inclusion that, you know, in really, really important rights, but economically, socially, it hasn't included them in the same way. Um, then I wanted to ask, did Lonro being an international corporation have hold any significance, right? I think it, it was deeply significant that you had um, for some 45 years, Indian ownership of this mill, right? Um, uh, transcending a sort of segregation of the pre apartheid period and the apartheid period. But did, did Lonro being an international company hold any significance? Right? In relation to their longevity, longevity as, a, as a relatively small operation of a single mill, having international connections seems to have been important in their ability to absorb losses. I think if it had been a local operator, they wouldn't have been able to survive. It mattered also in the ability to fight corporate battles and to make calculated and quite extensive investments in small-scale farmers. But here, international capital did not seek to challenge the existing division of labor, racial division of labor. That is, they were quite comfortable working with a particular form of racial capitalism in 20th century South Africa that tied race and class together. Right? It did, they didn't magically, or not magically, they didn't commit themselves to bringing small-scale farmers into the community providing you with education, um, uh, producing a new, a new managerial class, etc. There was no commitment to any kind of what we would today understand as transformation. Right? They were quite content to leave things as they were. Having said that, one could find some variation at the apex of this division of labor. Insofar as this capital, that was far more mobile and multinational than South African sugar capital, right, was able to mobilize you know, their international connections and their mobility and the upgrade of the mill. They were seen as a threat by local capitalists. Perhaps, too, we see their international character, even in the sale of Glendale, which for them was a question of multinational strate strategic positioning in Africa as a continent rather than, the, than a fight to control a national industry. Right? So the terms of were different, which spoke to them as a kind of global uh, player rather than um, in, in many or in several forms of production, rather than you know, sugar, exclusively sugar producers in one region of a country, right? Do we perhaps see here a movement from the racial division of labor to a condition of superfluous labor in South Africa, right? If racial capitalism in South Africa set in motion a specific structure that tied race and class together, including, in apartheid speak, all four population groups, right, which was socially and legally enforced, one might immediately say that in 1994, democracy put an end to this legally, if not fully socially. However, one can also recognize that class mobility did occur in some places, not here, well prior to the end of uh, apartheid. For black communities, there were longer, if uneven, histories of inclusion in professional classes and to university education and so on, from the 1970s. Our current Minister of Education's uh, PhD thesis uh, spoke specifically to the rise of the 1973, or after 1973, the black managerial class, the project of the PhD is called the corporate gorillas, right? Uh, and and it's, it's precisely tracing a longer history of, you know, of the breaking to some extent, or the softening to some extent of the, of the tight connection of race and class, right? Um, so sort of characteristic of, uh, of much of 20th century South Africa. With democracy, of course, race has not been replaced by class, as some have claimed. While some decoupling of race and class has occurred at more professional levels, and as I'm indicating, it's, a long, it's been longer than just from 94, the poor has remained overwhelmingly black African. But is their relationship, I'm sorry, uh, 
the same to the capitalist economy. So, in 1973, Wolfe's famous chief labor theorization suggested that there were three moments in the development of 20th century South African capitalism. A segregation period, right, in which mining dominated chief African labor and rural reserves supposedly subsidized urban wages, allowing white capitalists to massive profits by not paying the cost of reproduction. A second period in the first two decades of apartheid, where cheap labor was maintained even though rural reserves were overcrowded and there was no possibility of subsidizing cheap labor. Apartheid, all these points, is that was maintained <coughs> by increasingly brutal draconian policing rather than <coughs> any economic logic, right? And finally, the movement of industries themselves, if not itself, outside white urban areas to secure cheap labor without having without having to police migration. The aim, while not achieved, was to push Africans entirely out of cities. Right? Instead of being migrant workers, they would they would migrate, as in Glendale, from uh, four six kilometers over the over the border. Atlantis is a good example. Atlantis here in Cape Town is a good example of investment and so forth border industries, right? Yet it seems that, you know, at the, at the approaching the end of apartheid, and here we might be at another moment, where the overriding condition is, is that the majority of people become superfluous to capital itself. This does not mean, of course, they're not working formally or interacting with the mar market, but rather that from the standpoint of capitalist production, they are superfluous. Their labor does not need to be reproduced in order for cap capitalism to continue in the way that, say, in the South African colonial arrangements, for production to continue, cheap labor was needed, right? So, in the wake of the absence of necessity for capital to reproduce labor, the fate of superfluous populations falls to the state, right? There's no international corporation to care for them, and they do not make sufficient money on their own to reproduce themselves. Right? Regularly and steadily. Theorizing surplus, superfluous populations does reach back to Marxist capital, but also has also become a theme recently in development studies. In Tanya Lee's 2016 Distinguished Development and Change Lecture, she writes that the assumed narrative of transition to capitalism and the promise of labor continues to circulate, but, quote, in the global north and south alike, the transition narrative continues to do powerful ideological and material work as massive harms are justified in transition terms. It is astonishing and troubling that this narrative continues to hold such sway. We are living in an era in which huge and diverse sectors of the global population struggle to find work or any kind of productive function and viable source of livelihood. I see no prospect that this will turn around. And she uses this to question the telos the movement, the narrative of development studies to undeveloped to develop, or, or less developed to more developed. That, in fact, the whole basis of development and development thinking needs to be really shifted. Um, so we might say, in conclusion, that the shift between the period of Long Road Glendale and the present period of low-cost first-generation IDP houses with a population that survives largely in grants is one from a racial division of labor to superfluous populations who are housed, contained, and minimally cared for, but whose subject, forms of subjectivity are increasingly separate from the movement of capital. That is, they don't have a, they, their capacity to imagine life as members of the labor market, as full-time workers, is increasingly restricted, if, if not to imagine, to actually realize, right? So it would appear, in conclusion then, that Glendale has been remade twice. First by the entry of international capital, and second by its exit. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bruno. So let's take um, three to four questions or comments at a time, and can you please introduce yourselves? <laughs> Shall I start? My, yes. my name is Simon. Um, <laughs> and? Simon Becker. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I really I really find this this is this is challenging. I knew 
um, Bernard, that you've done work on this, on the, on this earlier. Um, I've got three comments, and then I've got, I've got a general question. I mean, the first comment is, since I'm at Steers at the moment, there is a study being done of value chains, and in particular, international value chains. And I wonder whether the fact that sugar from the Second World War, as I have it, and certainly still today with the difficulties that Tonga and Hewlett have, is a value chain that ends up largely overseas. In other words, we export our sugar. And in how far that ought to be part of your analysis, because you didn't actually look at where the sugar was going and if it was going into international areas, what were the pressures from that? That's my first comment. The second is, from what little I know of um, sugar cane production, um, I've, been, I've seen one or two of the small farms that you mentioned of, 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 of small laborers. I mean, sugar is a strange kind of agricultural production because for most of the year, as the grass grows, the, sh the sugar cane grows, there is very little one needs to do. And then there is intensive work, which is highly, highly physical, to cut the grass, to mow the grass, to cut the sugar cane. So even if one does think of small growers as possibly um, peasants, there is a real difficulty with regards to what they do during the two, three, four, six, nine months of the year and need to have intensive labor toward the end. And I wonder if that was part of of, of, of what you looked at. And having said that, um, you pointed to the fact is, are we talking about a reasonably independent peasantry or a, 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 um, a dependent agricultural workforce, I think whatever yes. the terminology was. I would agree completely with regard to them, it's the second, because they, sim they simply, if we took thinking about that value chain selling the sugar to, 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 to the Swiss to make chocolate, um, that, that they are totally dependent upon the mill market, rather than being able to develop some kind of autonomy. And then finally, as a last point, I mean, as you know, we, I did when I was at Rhodes University together with three others, including looking at Durban and, Quiz, and, and Natal as it then was, we studied the Bantu Affairs Administration Boards. And your presentation made a, a very interesting point because the Bantu Affairs Administration Board, Boards were, were white bodies responsible for black African administration outside of the homelands. And what happened in Indian areas, I don't know, but certainly I would say when you were speaking about the borders being changed and so on, I, if it's possible to find some of that, 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 that those documentation, what the Bantu Affairs Administration Board centered in, 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 in Durban, which if I remember correctly, was called the Port Natal Administration Board, what their policy and practice was with regard to the Glendale area would be very interesting to look at. Um, I mean, let me leave it there. And it's, it's very, it's a, it's, it's, it's a challenging case study. Thanks very much, Simon. And can you take a time more to put a lot of that? Um, I Thanks, Bernard. Also, I'm sure, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very really happy to be here. <laughs> um, so, yeah, also a couple of, of points. One just to, I don't know how much you've talked to Michaela. Um, so, Michaela Marcatelli, who was the first up, she's working with the idea of surplus population as well in relation to Fisca. Um, and, and so you might, you know, be able to talk to her, but she's, she's making the point about becoming economically superfluous now in the post-apartheid period, but, but politically significant in some way. And you don't, you kind of suggest that, by, you know, they're now dependent on the state of France, but you don't pick up on that at all, and whether that is part of your, your thinking, which, you know, it's, it's the vote every now and then, and of course the politics of KZN are locally and provincially very contested, but also nationally significant. So, so it's just 
you know, whether you're thinking about that, um, and, and she's, she's been talking about that, but then it's also where you're going with um, further remakings, potentially, you know, now, given what you're describing, and to what extent you look at issues like land reform and the possibilities and, you know, the moving away from sugar production, which is, you know, uh, monoculture of the worst sort, perhaps, um, whether you're looking at Ferguson's arguments around the fair share, you know, just how you're thinking about those issues in relation to um, future possibilities for a place like this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let me start with, um, with Cheryl. Um, so the um, you know the surplus the surplus population is the concept is something that I've been trying to think of a little bit. I was um, I think it's a it's useful and I need to I need to engage with more certainty. Um, Elsewhere, when I'm describing a more contemporary or post apartheid period, the, the question of political rights versus economic possibilities, you know, is, is, is certainly part of the analysis. Quite, uh, quite, you know, I elaborate that um, quite a lot. So I think, you know, I will look at Michaela's work. Um, it's a pity that that uh, we didn't have a chance to really speak about it when she was here. But anyway, maybe maybe she might visit at some point again. But um, but yes, yeah, so thank you. Uh, and certainly, I think the yeah the the question of the interaction I think is really really quite interesting. Um, uh, I mean, I guess what I am trying to point to is the, is the potential of a shift from a particular South African mode of racial capitalism to something more general. And what I still have to figure out is exactly how one theorizes race within that. You know. Um, race that is not related really to labor other than in its absence, right? Um, um, so, um, and I think, uh, um, you know, I've, I've, the focus has really been um, in, the more, in the more recent work on, on thinking about how it is that people in these RDP settlements sort of make life, what are the kinds of you know, from the questions of informal economy to, to politics to to the grant and what the grant does, um, to thinking about the grant and, and the wage together, um, and and questions of political representation as well as like youth and futures. Um, so I haven't really gone the way of thinking about land reform specifically, right? Uh, certainly, uh, there's questions of the title that you know, in a way, what I'm pointing to, I you know. I, I certainly I, the the argument should be elaborated, of course, but, but certainly I think I, I think that these these farmers, the small scale farmers, are uh, dependent is, is you know entirely dependent on the mill and increasing and very precarious. You know, if they if they don't have a mill to sell to, then they you know they're out. I think that I think someone's comments about the nature of sugar production is really interesting. Are really interesting. Uh, you know, I found some discussions of. People growing multiple things, uh, um, but being asked by the company by companies to grow exclusively sugar, and some resistance to this. Uh, um, you know, I think uh, there was an encouragement, there was a sense that this was empowering, but to what extent is it empowering? To what extent was it empowering, and how was it empowering? And, and the extent of land, I think, is, is interesting. Also, in light of you know many debates about many contemporary debates about land redistribution, how much land do people need, uh, what is, you know, what is the substance of, of, of land redistribution, is it, is it important simply to, to own land and to transfer land uh, that, was, that was dispossessed in the colonial, the colonial apartheid period back, it doesn't really matter what people grow, you know, and uh, what people do, or, does it, or do, do these things matter, right, um, and, you know, I'm certainly not an expert on those debates, but I think, um, um, I'm hoping that that thinking about you know this history of a of a promise of empowerment that really is not that uh, it might be useful. Uh, um, so I think um, thank you for the points about the uh, is it Beck and Humphreys uh, 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 volume um, about going to the affairs boards. 
Yeah, I mean, I have the, I mean, I have the documents, the archival documentation from the Fort Cell administration and what I need to look at it more closely in relation to arguments that, um, you know, you, you, your staff and others have made. I think it's, um, it was quite startling to see in the, in the archives the shifts of boundaries. And I know that in post apartheid South Africa, you know, there are demarcation boards around, um, around wards and, and, and uh, you know, this takes on sometimes political, it has some, some kinds of political um, implications around who votes, around services, around um, administration <laughs> and so forth. Um, but I have this striking example uh, from the early 1970s and not that much more on it. So I would, you know, I need to really look at the documents and perhaps find more. Uh, maybe go back to the other. I think the ones that I have are actually from the National Archives, um, the ones who uh, appears in the document rather than uh, the administration board. And, and that might also relate to when the ships of administration happen. Um, then, um, Yes, the, I think the, the comments uh, around, as I said, um, the time of production is really interesting, and you know what, how are people producing? I mean, certainly, I think um, the possibility, you know, the uh, uh, one thing about the, the time of production is that, you know, in a subtropical climate like the Cozumel Natal, things tend to grow all the time. So you may, it may be a kind of crop, but I don't know enough about this. But it doesn't have have a set a kind of growing and harvesting time as uh, as say here where where you know um, at certain times of year I think you know it's, it's impossible to plant right uh, um, um, I think the point about value change is really interesting and bring out a bit more about sugar you know there's this very famous ethnography uh, called sweetness and power um, which I keep thinking of but I, I you know finding ways to connect which is really about the, the kind of colonial uh, history of sugar and its connection to, you know, lifestyles, uh, to bourgeois lifestyles in the global north. Um, such a powerful book, but it's, uh, I mean, thinking about ways to connect it and, and maybe thinking through the value chain stuff would be, would be really helpful. So thank you. Questions comments? Yeah, so I think Bernard, yes, I mean, very, again, very interesting to see how you kind of move from the kind of deep historical focus on a particular place to kind of more general kind of um, ruminations about sort of global changes in, in capital. Um, your, your little narrative of, 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 of the mill, of the, of the what you, phrase you used, um, was sort of a, a museum, you know, a working museum or something, a major change. Yeah, yeah, that, of, was, that was actually... Um, <laughs> The man, you know, that that manages um, um, that manage that was from an interview, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, the, that's got me thinking, obviously, about the, the the significance of technology in this industry. I don't know sugar at all, but I mean, the kind of the you know, I'm very interested in this notion of of what Shunis calls platform capitalism, and, and there is a, I mean, there's a long-standing kind of sensitivity. Uh, within technology studies, it's at least 30 years going 30, 30 years back now, we've had this thing called the Moravix paradox. You know, this idea that increasingly machines are not are coming for routinized work generally, not just working class routine, right. routinized class. So, you know, well, the kind well, of we see we see it with the uh, you know with the with the recording of our lectures, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, um, that, uh, that the machines can. Well, this is the thing. So I mean, and, and, so if we start talking about the kind of the dominant narrative that get, gets pushed out this way, you know, the fourth, the so-called fourth industrial revolution, the subtext there is a certain kind of developmentalism, as you as you say, the idea that yes, the jobs are there. It's obviously it's the fourth industrial revolution. How can how can you have a revolution without the shifting of of of, of sort of work from one domain to another? Right? You might you might not be working in agriculture anymore, but there's going to be some other new domain that's going to replace it. That's the standard economic narrative. Now that that's the narrative that's that's, that's falling falling on its on, on its knees right now, and falling on its face that right, right right now. So I'm wondering whether your 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 your, 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 your reflections on technology more generally. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, <I> don't know. <laughs> 
I, I don't know. Um, thank you very much um, for this is quite stimulating, and I'm still trying to to make sense of some of the things that you that you said. But let me just take you back to what you said earlier about how we conduct this piece of history in the present. Um, the present. Um, I found it to be quite a strange type of history. Um, <laughs> strange in the sense that maybe I don't understand the way in which capital is organized, um, maybe in this part of the country or for this particular sector that you're looking at. Because it seems to me that the only time that there's been some pushback uh, in terms of how capital organize itself and, and sort of manage and control. It's through this intellectuals, the work of intellectuals. Um, I mean, the latest, uh, um, the latest, latest amounts of pieces um, when, when you mention it. But I find the history strange because there isn't any pushback by organized labor. And I wonder if the story, the history um, that we're telling will ever be complete if we don't really recognize, if we don't bring in the voices of of, of unions, because I know FAO has always been very, very, very strong in that particular sector of the economy, and which is what led to its dismissal from the subject, um, to form to form something. So would you like to talk about the role of labor in terms of how it organizes and how it sort of responded to this capital transformation that, that we had to spoke about? Because I think it's quite significant for, for, for South Africa. And, and you also mentioned the Marikana moment. Um, maybe just to keep it general, why, why, why Marikana? Um, why, 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 why did you mention Marikana? Is there anything in particular that happened that might have something to do with Marikana in this, in this strange history that you Thank you. But in relation to your last comment in response to um, Simon's question about, about value chains and so on, I was, and, and obviously the history of sugar and, and, and sugar plantations, I was wondering whether it would be useful to look at, at other spaces, right? Like Suriname which um, uh, experienced a very similar history to South Africa, colonized by the Dutch. In fact, they say that Manhattan, New York, was sold um, for sugar rights in, in, in Suriname uh, by the Dutch you know, to the English. <coughs> um, at first, slave labor in the plantations, and then eventually indentured labor from from India and, and, and so on. So I'm wondering whether a comparison to, to other parts of the world where um, similar processes would be useful or productive. But it also, I mean, doing such a comparison, I think, forces one to read outside of what, what we usually um, draw on as theoretical influences. Right, um, and I think for me, similarly in my PhD, I'm trying. It was di very difficult to write conceptually from a Marxist perspective about surplus populations and the unemployed, the relative surplus population, and, and, and so on. And in fact, um, so so I'm thinking that maybe one needs to. Look Elsewhere. And I found useful then, but very superficially, but now even more being exposed to decolonial reading and so on, the work of Animal uh, Quehano, which, which Awapi and um, Lagasic actually reference 
um, Annabel Lehano, who talks about the, 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 the surplus population within the architecture of um, the colonial power structure. And I just, I, I, I thought it was very interesting because people like him and, and um, those who use his um, theory around the coloniality of power and, and so on, they, there's an attempt to move beyond northern inspired modernist theory, right, to um, consider um, work done in places like, like South America in order to understand our colonial history, which, which I think could be quite fruitful and, and exciting to look beyond just um, Ferguson's uh, interpretation of modernity and African Modernity for that matter. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any, I know there's a lot to yeah. do. Uh, is it a short time? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> this one is very quick. Hello, my name is Simon again. <laughs> 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 uh, Bernard, Lloyd, Lloyd and I um, did research on on language in the metropolitan area of Durban some, some years back. And what was extraordinary to me in terms of the outcomes of that research was how high Indian Indian education on the part of it had been, how successful it was, and how successful the anglicization of the Indian population as a group, as, an, as a population group was, in comparison with the Zulu-speaking um, black African population. And that's, it struck me that maybe, you, you mentioned there was a school which would have been, quote, an Indian, unquote, school. And what kind of education was taking place at that time, if any, for the Zulu-speaking African population? And then to try and trace a comparison between those two groupings as the the narrative that the historical narrative unfolds. <laughs> no, okay. Um, thank you. Uh, four thousand. Um, um, okay. I'm not. I'm not an expert on um, education. I think our expert on education is left the room, but um, but. It has, you know, Bill Freund wrote about um, sort of transformations in, um, in, in, Indian, in the Indian community in Patel, right? Um, in the book, uh, the old book now. Um, and I think elsewhere he, was, he, he did speak about the 1960s and 70s as being a moment in which um, there was upward mobility into professional classes. And it was tied to education and, and, and so on. Um, why that is the case, I'm not sure. Certainly, uh, 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 and, and I don't know even that work well enough to say how he explains it, right? Uh, um, the, the little, the, the kind of little inkling I have that, that, that may be useful is that, that there were real investments in community education. Right and and in community schools um, and I mean an anecdote is that, that the final chapter of the book project is is a story really about young people education now today uh, um, uh, in this space and in fact how with very little grant money uh, that people receive the one investment they make is in sending their children to the best possible school they can um, and that means taking them out of Uganda right that makes, means taking them to to um, to uh, um, to what Stanga, uh, to any school they can get into because they you know they don't see a future through education and right? right? Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot to say there, um, but I don't know uh, enough about that history of, of 
of mobility, and you know, I would like to read that information to blade to blade's work as well, because uh, and and any other work work on on the rising black managerial class, because were there differences in, in KZN and elsewhere between the Indian and African in the 1970s and 80s in terms of accessing, um, you know, uh, accessing sort of more secure professional jobs? How did that relate to education? Uh, what kinds of mobility were involved? There's certainly in other work I did, you had the figure of the personnel manager, right? Where, you know, you have these lily white management these companies, but they they would employ a black personnel manager. That was about labor relations uh, a lot of the time, you know. Um, and so the history of that position um, is kind of interesting, uh, I think. But again, I don't know enough about the specifics that, uh, to answer you well. But I think it's a very important um, observation. Okay, Lloyd. I, I mean, I, I, I don't throw a title, but I'm sure my students do. I'm repeating a um, point that you know. For the contemporary generation, technology means like the, the most recent technology, but that you know a pen is a te is, is is technology too, right? Um, and uh, and then we it's dangerous to um, to naturalize it. Um, the I mean the the most obvious technology that I know about it, um, serving sugar in the area that I'm working in are the roads and the and the, and the trucks, right? Uh, because you know, sugarcane is often grown on fields and in, and in valleys that in which the landscape is, you know, it's the rolling hills of, 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 of the KwaZulu and South Coast. These are not flat places. And, you know, frequently in early accounts of sugar, you, you, you see trucks getting stuck, right? <coughs> Growing up hills and whatever. And so paving roads, you know, the, the interesting thing that once that somebody said to me, near my plan was, it's where the paved roads stop. Uh, after that, if you go into the interior, it's the former of homeland, it's just dirt road. But precisely, the, the paved road is the, is the sign of, of an investment that allows sugar to be transported, mm -hmm. right? That allows uh, uh, a cane to be transported, that allows a large truck of a, about a certain tonnage to travel, you know, which wouldn't be safe on a dirt road, especially if it's wet. Uh, so uh, there's obviously also the technologies in milling itself. Uh, in the process of, of, of converting raw sugar cane into, into sugar, right? Um, that's, you know, other than a very general answer about the speed of these technologies, I, you know, I don't know that much about, I mean, you know, I have the quotes, but I, I could go into the chemical process a little more. I mean, um, so I think that's useful. Uh, 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 to the extent to which this is, an, I, I don't think that this is what you might call a technologically determinist argument, but Certainly, I think that there, you know, there is something about the speed of production um, and the capacity to, to produce uh, um, quickly that does, that of course does shape, um, that, that does shape productivity and does shape, um, you know, the viability of business and profitability and the rest of it. So, um, you know, that's the most, the most general answer. The question of whether, um, of how many mills you actually need to, to generate the amount of sugar for an export market, uh, um, you know, I don't know, but, but more sophisticated production techniques can probably uh, enable that. But I don't have much more to say about uh, that, than, than, but I need to think more about that. Okay, Yankee, uh, I have to have a forgotten question. <laughs> I just need more time to think. Uh, Yankee, uh, so the, there are discussions, of course, uh, of sugar workers and trade unions, right? And um, and organizing sugar workers. Here, other than in, 19, in 1946, I found no evidence of any union activity explicit. Maybe that was because this was an exclusively, or largely exclusively, of the permanent workers and Indian community where there was where there was a, a mill and it was fairly cut off. But I'm not sure if that's correct. Uh, I need to look, but in the archives, the only thing that I found was a, a 1976 strike about, 1946 strike about, uh, about uh, the regularity of wages, right? Um, so um, whether that was because the kind of paternalist relations in an earlier period you know, were particularly smooth 
uh, whether it was at a, a later stage because there was a sense that the company rescued the area and therefore workers could ask for less because they felt that you know, their, their, their livelihoods had already been saved. I'm not sure I can speak to it. Uh, there's also an argument to be had at a more theoretical level about you know, whether um, you know, changing conditions of capitalism means that organized labor uh, plays the same role in, and this also relates in some way to what Bird is asking on technology, um, in shaping the direction of capital. If organized, if certain sectors of organized labor become more and more uh, superfluous to capital, if they no longer work in production the same way, if their roles and functions are broken out in such a way that there's no sort of, there's, there's less fewer workers but less solidarity between them, does organized labor still play the same, the same the same role in shaping, you know, what capital is, is that you know the capital labor compact that is, you know, that was so characteristic of some spaces in the 1970s and 80s. Does you know does it still apply, uh, it, or, or into the 1990s? Does it still work? Does it still does it still have coaches? So I think there's a general set of questions there. Whether uh, you know, again, it might be a theoretical question around whether you can tell a story of capital without labor, like. Whether that's adequate or not, or whether you always, as you, you put it, you're always missing a part, and therefore you have a strange history because somehow uh, uh, some part of this process is not being told. You know, is a question. I mean, is a, it's an empirical question, but it's also a theoretical question. You know, uh, here it seems to be empirically like you can tell this history without organized labor, but but what that means more generally to the history of the theories, theorization of capital, is a big question. Okay. Um, oh yeah. um, so thank you. I think um, um, I think the point about comparison is really is really uh, is really important and well taken. Um, and one of the difficulties is I think not just whether you use Ferguson or not, but and and to be fair, I mean, you know, of course one can speak about authorship, but but uh, um, you know. There is an there's an interesting attempt by him to compare different parts of Africa and different and and, and different kinds of um, techniques and and, and, uh, and you know forms of governance uh, 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 industries in, in, in different parts of the Tropical Belt, etc. These are in fact worked in different in different, uh, in different locations more than many, right? So, uh, but Tanya Marie Lee has worked in you know, I quote it's was worked in Asia, and, and her, 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 the, the, the basis of her analysis of Asia. Two of the people that I really want to kind of get to more who use the concept in some way are Jan Bremen, who works in uh, Sri Amsterdam, who works in India, and Rui Braga, who works in Brazil. Um, and you know they mobilize these concepts um, in interesting ways. And I don't think, um, you know, I think that they, in some way, Deterritorialize the theories or the origins of the theories in ways that I think are very productive. Uh, I need to, yeah, I'm going to follow up about I've certainly encountered them, but uh, uh, but I need to follow up more more um, more clearly. I mean that the other thing that you know, I think that might be worth saying, and that I thought you might ask me a question about. Um, mm -hmm. Is um, you know the the remark by Anne Vaughan around the fact that most of this small scale farming is done by women, mm -hmm. and what that also does if one really teases this out to um, you know stories of migrant labour to um, to an idea maybe an old Marxist idea that you can either be a worker or a, or a, a, an agriculture either. A, Proletarian or peasant, you know, and the idea that in fact many of these households straddle both the things. So, you know, one of the ways of softening the kind of dependency or autonomy kind of debate might be to say, well, you know, people took what they could. Uh, you know, they might have been, they might have grown, came and, and waited for nine months and gone and done other things. You know, that it doesn't have, they don't have to be, the identity doesn't have to be fully defined. To, by their work and, and by their particular productive uh, uh, things, so they might be, they, you know, they might have played, so to speak, you know, different authorities off each other, and also worked with the mobilities that were available to them, which at that moment were not huge, but nevertheless, 
there was migrant labor and there were, there, there were other forms of domestic work happening, certainly in Stanger at the time and, and, and elsewhere. So, so kind of reading these histories alongside each other would be interesting. I think that other, the other point is going back to the kind of international story is, you know, part of the challenge I think here and, and, and you know, maybe uh, some of the kind of deep learning stuff could help here, you know, is thinking about the specificity of apartheid and the apartheid division of labor versus um, versus other readings, say, of racial capitalism, working, thinking about other readings of, um, um, you know, questions of surplus population or dispossession, their connection to particular colonial authorities, and so on. Does a comparative colonialism, uh, like, how much does it allow us to see how these mechanisms work, and might it dilute the specificity mm -hmm. of, the, of, the, of the cases? And, of course, that's an ongoing challenge, how you bring in insights from elsewhere, but, uh, I mean, I'm tempted to, but I also find this, you know, complicated. I'm tempted to say, well, there is something about the 94 moment that globalizes, right? That, that in a sense, makes the South African story more comparable to other stories, whereas the apartheid, you know, and, and again, maybe this is a conventional argument that, that apartheid was in a certain sense exceptional at the moment when the world was turning away in the 1940s from, you know, intense uh, racial segregation that, that apartheid intensified at the moment when uh, when others were decolonizing, right? And mm -hmm. and so that the South African story and its exceptionalism, whatever the limits of that are, you know, do need to be told despite the, the resonances, despite the, the resonances with, out, with, with elsewhere. But uh, I'm not sold on that position. Certainly, finally, I would say, you could always say superfluous for who and from who, right? Uh, I mean, I've tried to make clear that this is all about capital and the superfluous is from capital. Uh, but one could say that, uh, you know, presumably with the kind of colonial the lens of colonialism or comparative colonialism saying that colonialism started to render everybody's superfluous and there are long histories of superfluous. This, this isn't linked in some ways to 1973 or 1994 or that, they, that in a way people are, people are, you know, at the moment of dispossession, they're rendered dependent and many of them are not given the means to, uh, the means to make a laugh at all. So that, that the danger of an argument about superfluous populations linked to a kind of shift in capital misses the way that colonialism imposed superfluousness on people from its get-go. And it's Shio Mbembe, to be fair, writes a, writes a piece um, for the aesthetics of superfluity, mm -hmm. I think 2003 or four, which, which tries to make, to some extent, this argument. It recognizes that there's a superfluousness from capital, but also suggests that there's a kind of colonial, there's a larger colonial question here. Um, so, thank you. That's been a, I hope that that's partially or a little bit satisfactory and very rich set of questions. Yeah, let's have another round. And then Sophia can move on. Okay. Uh, Shall you turn up? Um, I'll get your wallet now. I get a question. Um, okay, this is fascinating. Thanks so much for, um, for the discussion and everything in the day. So, so <clears throat> and I think your last question kind of gets somewhere where I'm trying to go with this. Um, look, I feel like it's very much, this is very much a work of South African sociological or anthropological historiography. Yeah. And what I mean by South African, it's so deeply indebted to its forefathers. Like I see the strain of Walby all the way through. Yeah. So someone like me who completely disagrees with Walby, I think Walby's analysis of how he sees capital is entirely false. It's not just false from Quijano's perspective, it is empirically and historically false. It's not about whether this, you know, like, well, what's his name, well, you know, um, this UWC guy says we can't import from South America. I don't care about that. It's not about that. The racial question of the racial hierarchy of value precedes the establishment of industrial capital in South Africa. That is, that is entirely true. <laughs> you can't go around and, like, beat around the bush, right? Because we have data, we have evidence of this kind of logic of, you know, from Jan van Riebeek's time, but Magubani and him wrote about it. David Chilister writes about religious studies. It's deeply racialized, right? It's, there's an intimacy between the emergence of science in the colony and, you know, this racial science. Um, Hundreds here, right? So Hundreys got this long history also of racial science. Okay, but her thing might be 19th century, but I'm saying 18th century already. So if 
So if this ratio of hierarchy of value, right, precedes industrial capital, then we can't be kind of like, you know, imprisoned by all these analyses. Right? The Land Act of 1910, I mean, I've discussed this with you before, I think it happened before his period as it comes up. Yeah. So I would agree by over your last point. Colonialism is the production of superfluous people. It's not superfluous labor. All we say is it's about the division of labor. That's like some kind of euphemism. You're first made superfluous in your place. And I think to understand this, one needs to engage much more with Indian historians. Right? Raj Chandra Varkar, analysis of the making of industrial Bombay, you know, he sees the transformation of the colonial economy. You've got native capital, yes, but you've got a heavily unfair system, right? And the native is not only the native capitalist, it's also the native, the average person who's like suffering famines and you know, all kinds of other things. So there's something there, I think, um, where I would say that, to quote, so, so, so that's the one point, right? Superfluous people. These are superfluous people. Even during apartheid or during the 1920s, we cannot possibly make the claim that black people in South Africa had any way close to full employment. No. This is the Marxist fiction. They're always going to study the people that are working. But the people that are working are like a tiny percentage of a place like South Africa. Most people are just It's very important to change our, and I think you have, the, you have actually the tools here to break those guys open. The second point is that you know, I feel like when I first started listening to you, I was like, hmm, apartheid is the entrenchment of racial division of labor? No, that's a euphemism. Later at the end, you say it's legally enforced. Very different. Entrenchment versus legally enforced, very different. So I need to know also, yes, Indian capital is more mobile than black labor, right? But Indian capital is not free. Right. There are instances, the Parlocks, the Parrocks, right? The Lockheads, you got the Mias. These people stand out. Why are they significant? Because they somehow managed to negotiate with the state to keep what they had, but they also lost it along the way. So my actual question is, why did the power sell? You see, you kind of tell us, oh, they sold. They got bailed out by party. Yes, we know about the intimacy between Indian capital and the party. In fact, mm -hmm. the islands, um, I recently found out that Parker and some of the other wealthy people negotiated to keep mm -hmm. islands India. Mm -hmm. Because if islands became cutted, they lost all their property. Right? So they entrench their power through that system. It doesn't mean they did not lose, so they also own property in Newton, in Clamont, right? other valuable property. So firstly, there's that thing. You know, it's definitely not free. But the other more important thing is that, why did they sell it? 1960s is grand apartheid. Yeah. And I think the, the way you tell the story runs a big risk of falling into this kind of, you know, this kind of like friendly story. So we happened to be in apartheid. I wrote you, I made a note. I was like, apartheid produces a sign. Post apartheid, apartheid. No, apartheid not, a, apartheid not a sign, right? It's a legal system, which is also developing very, very strongly with the death squad, with um, you know the secret police, with the bulldozers. You know, there is negotiation. No, I absolutely agree with you. It's not a one-way street, but it's not like just you know the thing. And so I want to know why. That's the interesting thing. Why are the pirates going investing? If these guys are capitalists from 1920, you think they can't see? Wait a minute, all the white people are voting for an apartheid regime. Okay, maybe I stop investing. These guys are going to take my money. Where do they put their money? A lot of these guys put their money back in India. Some of them took their money to London. These are much more interesting things, I think, that can tell you really what's happening than this kind of stuff. So that, that, that's one empirical thing which could really uh, you, you know, bring it up. The third point is the national capital. You know, you're not saying this, but I'll push you up. But you know, it's almost like coming up, maybe it's this panacea, you know? International capital counts, and no, it's not that, and I think this is where we're indebted to all these. It's not the racial capital of South Africa, you know? It's the international capital. Because there's an idea in capitalism that, you know, there's this idea of freedom that comes with it. Now, I don't agree with that, because Lon Roy, I just quickly Googled them, right? It's an old British company. So these guys have deep colonial roots. Yeah. It's interesting how you show us that the sugar, sugarocracies, are also these old colonial estates. But we know from what we know about the history of you know, colonial capital, that that's also Hewlett, that's also, that's also Cadbury, that's also Nestle, you know, all these guys. So being a British company that kind of enters the space, I think they are not just international capital. They are global capital with some kind of colonial roots who also are white yeah. <laughs> in their dealings. You mentioned how they could basically go to the court. Yeah, because the pirates probably couldn't stay in the court. Right? So again, without that social dynamic, it seems like you know we, it, it, there's a risk of making this international capital this kind of 
you know, this thing which is happening. And of course, I was thinking about the boycott, right? So international capital from the 1970s is actually defined the boycott, yeah. right? And so they are not just small. And I'm thinking about Coca-Cola, you know? So I have an anecdote for you. I go, okay, one minute. And then anecdote, so my grandfather was an Indian capitalist in a way. Uh, unfortunately, not a very successful one, otherwise I might also be an Indian capitalist. <laughs> but he, um, so Coca-Cola, for example, used to, used to pay the police to not let his truck go into the location. But Coca-Cola's trucks would go into the location, first thing. So this international capital was very intimate with the apartheid policing. The second thing was that they actually used to buy all the extra bottles and they made them bankrupt. Because they used to buy the, um, the empties, right? And in the cool, he had a cool infection. In the cool infection. So for him, yes, it was consolidation of size, it was macro, it was all these guys, but they were not separate yeah. from authoritarian states. Sure. They were using the state to do their things. Um, and then the final point was that this born person, I think you kind of go against them. I think again, you know, this is very interesting. Sometimes these developmentalists, and you mentioned that, you know, they'll go and see something and they'll be like, oh, it's not really that. You're not actually suffering. But now you're doing an ethnography and maybe there's something else, you know. Right. And I really like, again, I'll mention that guy, you know, the Tausik, you know. But there's something more, there's something more to having, to being a small, a small producer than whether you're really independent or not. Yeah, yeah. And that other value maybe you get at ethnographic thing. But anyway, so I can a lecture. That's great. Yeah. Unless they're really pressing final yeah, questions. Well, Shahid took my question. Wow. Yeah. 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 You also had a, a yeah, that was exactly. You also had a, 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 a grandfather modeling software. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm afraid my question isn't as powerful. <laughs> but what I found so interesting was this description of kind of what the state of Glendale is now, you know, with this infrastructural deprivation and investment and then sudden retreat. You know, we see it so often around South Africa, and it reminds me a little bit of what happened in Eswatini with all these South African businesses flooding in to avoid trade tariffs during the apartheid and then leaving and, you know, the circumstances that are left and this kind of very social thickness where you invest not just in the industry but the area. I find that so interesting, but I just, perhaps this isn't the focus of your research, but I just wanted to ask if you considered or have got any thoughts about what a contemporary, more sustainable investment model could look like. I mean, we've engaged with this so much about with the Amazon development and, and, and you know, where, I mean, obviously that's incredibly problematic because it's quite inward focus, but it's, I just, would love to hear your thoughts on what uh, we could do to either remedy situations like this with further investment, what that could look like, and further sustainable research. And then there may be one more. Oh, uh, from Lisa. So you get we about six companies telling me how they could buy X companies. No, I think it's just a, it's a very good um, parallel. Okay. So one of the buy this place that had massive mining um, and it had a fishing industry around the same time. And then the mining collapsed the fishing industry because they pushed back the ocean. And what is left? And I think there's this very interesting analysis of the ruins and yeah. um, and this, this not going not going to the boom and the bust, but what is afterwards and what values then become important. I think that could be important to bring in. And think, fracturing. Like the, the, the I think that's great. So yeah. let me start with you. The, the, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that. Um, yeah, I mean, in a way, the whole book is about uh, uh, is about what's left, you know, and 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 what's left in what's left in a sense when a state makes an investment under the, the under the hope or aspiration, if we generous, of reversing some of the some of these 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 long wounds. Uh, but how is it, you know, how it exists at the same time as as uh, as these disinvestments, as these schemes that. Attempted to do something and then, and then, and then failed, right? Um, you know, failed or, or uh, uh, in the long run sort of fell apart. And the implications, not just for business or for work, but but socially and what that you know what those are, um, and what is it imagine to imagine a sort of social space, a, a town or community where there where there is no work, right? Um, so that's really the subject of the of the book. But uh, I think the concept of ruin is very interesting to think of. And, 
as well as as well as you know all the things that go with ruin, the kind of material ultra, uh, culture that goes with ruin. You know, what does one see? What is the debris uh, that that is left behind? What do we you know? How do people refer to those those physical objects uh, that once pointed to something and are no longer doing what they what they promised? Um, um, so yeah, I, I can't promise a, 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 a kind of a clear clear answer of what works. Uh, you know, part of, me, part of me is tempted, uh, part of me was to provoke Shahid, is to say, uh, you, know, <laughs> if, you know, you can't have capital in the human face. It just, you know, I mean, it, it doesn't work, you know, it, it, in some way, um, yes, you know, when when there are forms of investment that, that can compose life, um, uh, um, and that people can, can rally around. Of course, uh, there are much better social scenarios that can be produced than than, um, than spaces in which um, in which those shall we call them those social welfare, those social infrastructural things are just you know left to you know neglected or, or where the state is unable to to to, to perform those functions. Then then it becomes a problem. But I think everywhere. In many places, you know, and this is part of a global story, you know, whether we talk about a place like Flint, Michigan, or wherever, where the, you know, the water, where water collapses, or, um, you know, or, or elsewhere in the world where, where, where basic services are collapsing. These are things that somehow are compact between the state and capital at one stage may happen and no longer, and this is no longer the case, or this is breaking into fundamental way. Sometimes that has to do with uh, with a weakness in the state. Sometimes that has to do with the weakness of particular cap, particular schemes, changing industries. Um, the dynamic that you described to me is, is very is very powerful. That you know that there was a mining and fishery competition that in that in the way it's kind of, um, you know it's left it's left real devastation. So um, okay, so let me try to show you um, the. I mean, I would say this, and, and I'm not necessarily committed to Wolf or not, but it's certainly true that that the longer history of racism and colonialism and imperialism, and colonization, insofar as those are distinct things, um, you know, exists well before industrial capitalism. The question is, how does industrial capitalism remake, uh, or does it remake the spaces? Uh, does it leave those relations fundamentally untouched, or does it re does it change them, right? Um, and and how does it change them? If the claim, and like maybe this is a European claim, maybe this you know maybe the story is uh, you know Marxist you know Marxist evidence particularly in, uh, in it's too European to apply. And of course, there's you know, Chakravarti and others write about this. You know the question of uh, whether capitalism remakes feudal Relations, whether it remakes colonial relations in a particular way, whether it grasps onto those relations and um, and alters them in some way and keeps other parts of them untouched, I'm not sure. But certainly, in my reading, I mean, we can critique all people. We have to we have to take them at the strongest. Uh, you know, it's that it's that uh, mining capital seizes onto already a, a racist colonial administration and. With the help of that administration, dispossesses people from their land, uh, uh, makes them dependent on wages, uh, and um, um, tax, taxes them, and and uh, and therefore pushes them into uh, into highly unequal, highly exploitative, highly violent uh, labor relations. Uh, I think his the point of his contrast between. Segregation and apartheid is that uh, that what he wants to show is that apartheid is not just a continuation of an, of, 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 a, of a colonial system. That that while mining capital pioneered the system, the extension of the system to capitalism in general has meant in South Africa has meant the uh, at the same time as the so-called reserves, um, which are supposed to and the system provide social reproduction. For people, have collapsed, and the only way to do that is through intense violence. But that violence, so that but that violence is not, you know, you, one might argue that, that that violence has existed throughout colonialism. That this is just the same thing. Uh, 
his argument is that would that would be that that specific violence is a product of of this failed system that interacts already with capital. So, uh, in a way, he implicates people uh, far more broadly in domination than, than say, only uh, the violent colonials. Everybody becomes implicated in this. Now, again, of course you're right. Not, uh, there were only a fraction of people working. But we must be careful not to be too individualistic. Money passes through families, through kin network, as you know. Uh, and you know, some anthropological work has shown that uh, migrant wages did pay for households, rural households, in all sorts of ways, despite the, the exploitation. So uh, I'm not. I'm more cautious, perhaps, whether whether you know uh, whether I uh, um, accept wealthy or not. I'm a bit more cautious to just say. <coughs> You know, we throw this out. I think an interesting entry point, and what I'm thinking with, but I haven't got to, is, you know, um, different readings of racial capitalism. Because in some places, the reading of racial capitalism doesn't require labor, right, at all. It's 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 about it's about exploitation and violence, and about the extraction of of, of capitalism, the making of capitalism by and through racial domination. In South Africa, where the term actually comes from, right? The intermediary point is precisely uh, the organization of, of labor. Now, now one can think more with that, and I think that, that that's interesting. But I'm not sure, uh, again, I'm not so sure that, that I want to dismiss it. But of course, I think the point is not to, is, is the point is also to say that I think the, um, that the, that the, um, <laughs> yeah, they, I think there were, of course, negotiations. Whether it's sufficient, and I accept your challenge, whether it's sufficient to say that Farouk sold Glendale for an economic reason, in other words, that the sugar industry, which is sort of what I laid with, even if I, even if I didn't make it explicit, the sugar industry expanded technologically and um, Commercially, to such an extent that they could no longer, it no longer seemed like a viable investment to upgrade the world, whether it was just that purely economically, or whether there were other factors that, for instance, because they were the only Indian uh, 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 owner, they were pushed about, they couldn't go to court, they couldn't, they, you know, they, there were no grounds for them to improve. You know, I'm not sure. That's something that, that to some extent, is, a con is conjecture. Certainly, they didn't become poor. So they, 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 you know, they, they didn't as a as a family they didn't they didn't fail. But whether Glendale was a viable investment or not, and whether they decided at some point that it was no longer, right? Um, you know, whether at some whether when it was bought it was a kind of prestige thing, whether it makes money or not, and whether by the 1960s it was just like a sign that you don't you know you know you don't want anymore because it's costing you a lot of money. I'm not sure. That's a that's a question that I, you know, I would like to tease out uh, uh, more. But I, I, I wouldn't, uh, you know, precisely. I think the claim about racial origins of labor suggests, you know, that in South Africa under apartheid, they, you know, that this, and, and I didn't fully get the point about about entrenchment versus legal, but, but we can talk more about that. You know, that, that these categories were so pegged to. Uh, these racial population groups, I mean, I, you know, I use, I use this term very cautiously, um, were pegged to a, to a particular set of capacity that wasn't just about labor, of course, it was about capital, it was about the possibility of, of movement, access, etc. Um, that was, you know, quite totalizing. Um, and, um, you know, I think there's, a, there's certainly a story to be told here about, uh, uh, from the perspective of Paru, uh, uh, you know what it meant to to have these investments. What it meant to to be in this family during during apartheid, which was not simply a story of any other captives, so we shall so to speak. I think it, I think it's a very it's 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 a worthwhile story in itself. Now I think my notes are exhausted. I'm, I'm rather exhausted, but uh, um, I know there were other challenges for me too. So uh, um, so we'll, we can speak more. Thanks very much, Bernie. I think Shaw had a point as well. It's fine. Can you make another comment?
context, I mean, one was, I was, sounds introducing me another whole set of issues. One was relating to the migrant labor system, labor, and your work on the movement between Durban docks, migrant workers, etc. I was just wanting to ask how that filters into your larger analysis, maybe not what you presented here. So that was the one question comment. And then the other was on, I was just intrigued by your discussion on the border boundaries. And I'm assuming you're talking about the, the, the process around the consolidation of the Vantus land, mm. etc., the 73, 72, 73, and then finally the 75 yeah. borders. And you were seeming to suggest that there were quite local arguments going on and considerations. It's just interesting to think about the way in which they played out into, a, into that larger national project of consolidation of particularly because of you to tell us. Absolutely. So it was more of a question about that. We wrote a little bit, there's a little bit about NSPP, yeah. but it's not that kind of, you know, it's not that archival work that you seem to be suggesting is there. Well, there's some stuff that you It would be like interesting that. to look at those local negotiations yeah. that affect a broad national plan. And, and I mean, back to Jay's point as well, you know, who could negotiate? In what terms could they negotiate? You know, what did it mean to negotiate for an Indian space? Um, you know, was this done under a register of you know, separate development or whatever? What, what were the terms of this kind of negotiation? Um, but yes, thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you all. Uh, and I think there's a whole lot of pockets of freehold land in that area yeah. as well. Yeah. Like yeah. Freehold land. So also, where does that fit in? Well, that's okay. <laughs> okay, so thank you. And I hope this is very useful for yeah, yeah, your yeah. own project, but for me personally.